thanks Lian Pen so much for this introduction. <laughs> and I'm very happy uh, that I get to talk to you today about the use of soundscapes to detect tropical forest degradation. Actually, I was here two years ago while still doing my PhD, and I gave a short talk about using the conservation drones to detect degradation in tropical forests. So you can see that I haven't really moved away from that topic. It's still something that's really interesting to me. And today I want to talk to you about a case study, the, my first study on the soundscape, which is from Papua New Guinea. And this project, I've uh, worked on this with three collaborators from the Nature Conservancy, Eddie Game, Tim Boucher, and Cosmos Affairs, and then three collaborators from QUT, who have done most of the heavy computing. So please inter uh, interrupt me anytime if you have any pressing questions. And first of all, I want to talk a little bit about why actually should we try to use soundscapes. So as you are probably aware, animals are really good at communicating. They communicate with color, with smell, but most importantly, or very importantly, in the tropics with sound. But just as the food resources and the space in the rainforest are limited, so is the communication space. And you can think about it in in terms of time, if you and I talk at the same time, we won't know who's saying what. And also you have to think about it in terms of frequency. If we talk exactly at the same pitch, we won't probably hear each other. And so um, in the 80s, Bernie Krauss proposed what is called the acoustic niche hypothesis. He thought that animals have evolved to communicate at different frequencies and different times to occupy this communication space. And I'll be calling this communication scape, uh, space, the soundscape. And so this acoustic niche hypothesis is something that we as uh, ecologists and conservation scientists just have to take advantage of. So if you think about a uh, tropical rainforest, like this one in the Edelbert Mountains of Papua New Guinea, its soundscape is really saturated. So on this cartoon, time is again on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis, every pink square means that that particular frequency time window has some animal calling in it. But then when you start disturbing the forest, you start maybe hunting some animals away or chasing them out, the soundscape might become less and less saturated. And this is exactly what we decided to test in the Edelbert Mountains of Papua New Guinea, to see whether the soundscapes are becoming less saturated as you start disturbing them more. So, Obviously, it's good to test any new technology uh, with a test of fire. That's why we chose Papua New Guinea. We chose one of the more remote areas in the Elbert Mountains, which is about three or four hours drive from Madang, from a city, and then a couple of days walk to these remote villages. So even though the walk was pretty long and hard, it was really worth it. <laughs> communities we visited, and we visited three different ones, prepared this really elaborate uh, welcome ceremony for us. And they were actually the ones who asked some, for some research to be done on their territory, because they, about 10 years ago, they decided to set aside parts of their land to different land uses. The problem they initially had was they were running out of animals to hunt. So they decided, with the, they had some help from the Nature Conservancy, they decided that if they set aside some of their land just for conservation, they won't do anything in the forest, uh, that that might be better for their animals that they could hunt in these special hunting zones they allocated. Then some other parts of their land they would allocate to gardening, which is the main way to uh, get food. So they plant bananas and sago plants and so on. And then finally, some parts of their land they would dedicate just to cocoa plantations, which is a more intense land use. Here is a map of the area. So each community is uh, outlined in black. And we went, and the different colors are the different land use zones. 
And we went to the furthest three communities, Musia, Munati, Avera, and Ivarame. And you can see that each community has its own conservation zone, its own hunting zone, and its own gardening zone. So with the great help of the local people who took us around their forest, we deployed 35 recorders at 35 different sites. And we left them recording continuously for usually 48 hours because we wanted a solid 24-hour block. But with the logistics, it was more um, 48. So the next thing then is what do we do with all these recordings? First of all, we can listen to them. This is from the conservation zone at around 5.30 p.m. I guess you get the idea that you could listen to this for a few hours, but then if you would listen to 70 times, 24 hours, that might take quite a lot of postdoc time. So uh, we had to come up with a different way to quantify and analyze our data. By the way, if you want to listen to any of the many hours, you can go on this website, ecosounds.org, and all of our data is available for looking at as spectrograms or listening to. So then these spectrograms where you uh, kind of translate the sound data into frequency and times is also not really um, so practical because if you were to draw a s or a print spectrogram for 24 hours, it would be about a mile long. So again, we couldn't look at every single site at every single time point. So we had to come up with a way to somehow compact the data. And we calculated various indices, and the one I will talk about today is acoustic power. It's a really simple way to uh, look at the data. So each minute, for each minute, we calculated what is the maximum acoustic power, so how many decibels are there. And we calculated that for each frequency bin separately. So our frequency bins were about 50 hertz. So then the slide from the previous, uh, this picture from the previous slide, would just be less than one little point on this graph, which is for uh, about 12 hours or so. So this already gives us some, some way to compact the data. We get about, yeah, we get one data point for one minute, but then we have about 256 of these frequency bins. So the next step is then we wanted to calculate some uh, measure of how saturated these soundscapes are at any given point. So this is again a cartoon where the darker the color, uh, the more acoustic power there is in each block. And then we come up with a threshold. In this example, it's 10 decibel. And anything that's above would count as a sound really made by an animal rather than some background noise. And then for each minute, we would we then convert the data to just ones and zeros. So for each minute, we can then look at, okay, what proportion of the frequency bins for that minute have some sound in them? So eventually we get just a percentage of saturation for each minute. So this is just a summary of how we get from the rainforest to the soundscape saturation. We record it, we transfer it to, we, we make spectrograms, then we compact the data to one minute one frequency uh, bins, and from that we get the saturation per minute. So the next question is then how to, how to even analyze the data in some sensible way. This is an example of soundscape saturation for one side, for conservation side, for 24 hours. So on the x-axis is one day from midnight to midnight, and on the y-axis is the percentage saturation. So 100% would mean that there is a lot of animals, a lot of birds, insects, as well as amphibians covering the whole frequency spectrum. And zero would mean there's nothing going on. So you can see that it's quite different from another side. This is from a gardening zone, which doesn't have these two peaks that you see in the morning and in the evening. So then we wanted to find a way to quantify or to figure out how and why do these different sites have different saturation patterns throughout the day. Uh, we looked at three different environmental variables, altitude, slope, and how far from rivers the site was. 
and then a couple of other variables that described the intensity of the human use of that forest. We used the information theoretic approach to pick the best possible combination of these variables that would explain the variation in soundscape saturation between the sites. And we did that separately for each minute. Because obviously, if at, I don't know, half past 12, the data point is not independent from half past 12 in one minute. So it turned out that the single most important variable was whether that site is forested or not, whether it has continuous canopy cover. And this is what the model looks like when we fit it. So uh, on the y-axis this time is the predicted soundscape saturation. The black dots are the forested sites with gray bands as 95% confidence intervals, and the red ones are the non-forested sites. So you can see that overall the saturation of the forested sites is higher, and also there are these two peaks, one in the morning, one in the evening, that are almost missing at the non-forested sites. And that's pretty serious because if you have done any ornithology surveys or if you ask ornithologists from across the tropics, they will tell you that the number of bird species that you see in the morning during the dawn chorus is usually pretty tightly correlated with the total diversity for the whole site. So then if we believe that sa high saturation means high diversity, then it seems that at the non forested sites we're losing quite a lot of species because we're losing these two peaks. But then we also looked at what, what matters at the forested sites, and it seemed that altitude was the most important variable. So the higher you go up, the more saturated the soundscapes are. And if that corresponds to higher bi biodiversity of birds, that would fit pretty well with what traditional surveys have found. They found that altitude is the most important factor determining that species. Uh, and species richness. And then so uh, we also looked at the non-forested sites separately. And it, that, was, that story was a bit more complicated. So in the mornings, the distance from continuous piece of forest was the most important variable. So the further you go from a continuous forest, the less saturated the soundscape is. But in the evenings, it seemed that the number of remaining trees in the gardens and cocoa plantations was the most important thing. So the more trees you leave out in the gardens, the more saturation you have. And that makes sense because in the evenings we would see all these birds and insects perching in the tre remaining trees making a lot of noise. So to conclude, I want to answer two questions. The first one is my original question, is how does the increasing human use of forests in Papua New Guinea uh, influence soundscape saturation. So the, as I said earlier, the most important thing is whether the site is forested or not. And from the conservation perspective, whether these communities should or shouldn't be doing this land use planning, whether it's working, we think that it's probably a good idea that each community has its own conservation zone and own gardening zone, uh, simply because it seems that the further you go from continuous forest, the less soundscape saturation and therefore probably the less biodiversity you have. And also the communities probably wouldn't want to share their conservation zones anyway because most of the time they were just asking us whether their conservation zone is better than the neighboring one. And also they usually don't speak the same language <laughs> as the neighboring village. So, so it's good that they have separate, even if very small, but um, their own conservation zones. And then I, I would like to spend the last few minutes talking about soundscapes in general, what, it, what I've learned from this project and whether I think it's actually a useful tool. Maybe I'm biased, but I think it, it is a useful tool because you can get a lot of high quality data and you can get it fast, which means cheap, which means usually good. And the, the great thing is that the data is objective. It's not influenced by who was collecting it. It's not, you know, there's no disturbance to the animals. So you get even shy species. And what it means that we will be able to reanalyze the data in five, 10, or 20 years compared with it. And it's, yeah, it, the data will always be the same. So we have some sort of permanent baseline. Then I hope I have 
demonstrated that we could use soundscapes in real underground conservation problems and that by now we have some robust uh, way to interpret the results and relate soundscapes to environmental variables. And then I think in the future we're trying to do several things. One of them would be identifying individual species, maybe using species recognition algorithms and crowdsourcing as well, or some citizen science. And uh, that's already possible somewhat. On, on the website ecosounds.org, you can go to the spectrograms, look at, um, if you see some interesting pattern in the spectrogram, you can listen to it and then start typing. If you think, oh, this is species that I know, then you can mark that up, share that with us. So if you're interested in Papua New Guinea, birds or amphibians or insects, please go on and mark some species for us. And uh, also the, another project that we're trying to continue the soundscape is trying to scale up because I think the cheapness and the ease of deploying the soundscape is something that we have to use. So we're trying to cover larger areas that would be impossible if we just had field ba uh, ground-based surveys. Thanks very much and please ask me any questions if you have any. Thank you.